Hello, my name is Tim, and today I'm going to discuss some of the contributions in my thesis entitled Automotive Safety Validation in Simulation. Alright, so to start with, we're going to look at three modes of transportation, so air, car, and train, and uh, we're going to try to look at why it is perhaps that automotive is so difficult to uh, establish confidence in the safety in. Um, so we have, for instance, air with three spatial dimensions, a uh, car which is principally two spatial dimensions, and the and train is principally uh, one spatial dimension. And uh, at first glance you might think, okay, well, uh, planes have three dimensions, that's more complicated than two, which is more complicated than one. Um, however, at the same time, uh, because you're maneuvering three dimensions, maybe you have more options that results in you having more good options. And so maybe it's easier because you have all this space to avoid people in. Um, uh, that being said, the uh, two spatial dimensions that cars inhibit or inhabit are somewhat more complicated because you have all these roadways and obstacles, uh, whereas planes are basically in open space and uh, trains in their one-dimensional maneuvering <laughs> uh, rail space uh, basically just go forward and back. And so, yeah, there's something interesting there to think about. Uh, second is the fact that cars are piloted by amateurs, whereas planes and trains are piloted by professionals. Um, this means that, well, A, it could suggest that cars are easier, but it also means that everybody around you um, is not quite as highly trained as you might like them to be, which I'm sure all of us have experienced. Um, we can also look at vehicle quantities. Uh, there are far more cars than there are of the other types of transportation methods. And uh, this, uh, this adds a challenge in A, you have to deal with more entities, which we'll get to, but B, also there's uh, quite a lot of diversity in the terms of types of cars, um, and we need to, need to consider all of these different things. Uh, the cost of electronics that go into uh, cars tend to be much lower than the average cost of electronics that goes into something like a plane, um, and uh, these cars will then have to function with um, lower cost electronics, which means establishing the safety in them uh, may actually be harder for those reasons. Um, accident investigations for cars tends to be less extensive than it is if there, for instance, is a plane crash. And uh, part of that is uh, that kind of is tied to that is the ownership of the results of such investigations isn't always made or isn't always shared as widely. So I know I have uh, public and private. What I mean here, instead of public, what I really mean is that uh, programs like Asias in the aircraft industry will take these accident investigation reports and they'll anonymize it, but then they'll share it with other entities within the SIS program so that other companies can then drive safety um, towards higher safety. Um, whereas with cars, it's um, not as widely shared and many of the companies have tighter control on how to get access to the data in a car's black box. Uh, we can also look at things like passenger fatalities. And so um, here we have just the straight up safety numbers. Uh, so aircraft are incredibly, incredibly safe. Whereas uh, cars, for instance, are two orders of magnitude less safe. And that's present day humans. And so as we introduce autonomous cars, hopefully things get safer. But, uh, but for now, there clearly is a problem with uh, the vehicles. Um, we also have uh, entity interactions, which I believe are perhaps the most significant difference between plane, trail, uh, train, and cars. And that is that cars, when you're driving, you have to deal with so many people around you. All of these different other cars other pedestrians, cyclists, motorcyclists, trucks, you might have obstacles, um, all of these other entities that you're interacting with. Um, and uh, in comparison, aircraft, you're in this three-dimensional space and you're in the sky and there are like six other objects around you. Um, or with a train, you just have the thing in front of you or the thing behind you. Um, and so with cars, you have to deal with so much more. Um, you have the intricate complexities of the real world, and these are all other entities that are also reasoning about what's around them. And if you do something different, they will all react and respond in a different way, which then causes you to react and respond. And uh, this uh, complex set of interactions is, I think at its core, what makes autonomous driving so difficult. 
um, especially considering like sure we're pretty good at predicting and modeling physical mechanical behavior but predicting and modeling interactions and how interactions fail and how humans fail that's uh, that's kind of at the core of what makes autonomous driving difficult all right, so let's look at um, a particular safety system. So here we have uh, an existing safety system from the Mercedes-Benz E-Class, came out in 2009. Um, and this car has a um, automatic emergency braking system, or a braking assist system, that will prevent collisions. And so here you are perhaps uh, cruising down the German Autobahn, and uh, your vehicle has sensors that can detect another car in front of you and perhaps the other car is going uh, too slow or is stopped and you're going too fast and uh, your safety system can kick in and uh, in its first phase will uh, magnify braking power and so this means if you hit the brakes it will increase the amount by which those brakes are activated and uh, this was triggered in real world driving tests where um, they drove on the German Autobahn with the car and uh, this phase was encountered about once every 50,000 kilometers to 100,000 kilometers. Uh, however, there's a second phase. And this is uh, kind of the, the final critical phase where 100% braking power is applied. If you get too close to that, to that obstacle, or you're about to hit it. And um, during all of the testing, over 36 million kilometers, uh, this was never triggered uh, in real world testing. Um, so you have such a rare event um, that was never triggered. You have to think, for a fully autonomous car with so many more things that can happen, how can we even establish confidence that we've tested all of these different phases, if you will, or critical situations? Well, now, to put this number into perspective, 36 million kilometers, um, if you hired one person to drive eight hours a day uh, at highway speeds, it would take them about 110 years to cover 36 million kilometers. And that's just to test this simple system. Fully autonomous vehicles present entirely different challenges. Um, so let's look at some numbers. Um, so we have here um, Fahadal, who claimed that current safety systems require up to 2 million test kilometers. So that's something like the braking assist system we already looked at. Uh, but then more complicated systems like fully autonomous cars here, uh, Colorado all claim 14.2 billion kilometers, billion, <laughs> with a B, uh, to estimate the fatality rate, so one criticality metric, to within 20%, with 95% confidence, to test the, a system that's as safe as humans. So if we build an autonomous car that's as safe as humans, it takes a lot of real-world testing to get there. Um, and, and that's just for one metric. And similarly, uh, Wachenfeld et al. Uh, claim 2.1 billion kilometers, and this is for a system twice as safe. As a human, so um, if we get noticeably better than a human, it goes down. But we're still talking about billions of kilometers. Um, and now I wouldn't claim that these are the V numbers, like the exact amount that you need to test and then you're done. But um, I would say that this definitely shows the difficulty of testing such complicated systems, and that these billions of miles are perhaps not feasible. Especially if you uh, assume that if you're going to test a system, you can't like change anything halfway through, like put in a software patch. Uh, you still have to rerun your billions of miles. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Jan Becker, Dr. Jan Becker, who claims that um, validation expenditure will increase by a factor of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7. So not only do we have to do a lot more testing, but we have to pay a lot more money in order to get the testing done. And this presents a, a big problem for, uh, for the automotive industry um, in order to get these autonomous cars out on the road. Um, all right. And so the core idea here is that we have the real world, and testing in the real world is extremely expensive. Uh, it takes a whole lot of time, and uh, presumably it has high risk in that while you're doing these billion miles of tests, you might uh, encounter collisions or have accidents. And like, for instance, Google and Tesla have already um, encountered things of that nature. So what we'd like to do as much as possible is move to simulation, where simulation promises to be cheap, fast, and uh, poses no risk to human life. Um, however, and this is, uh, this is a big, big however, simulation requires models. And uh, we're moving from the real world, which is perfect, to approximations thereof. And we need to make sure that our models still adequately, adequately capture what we need them to so that our simulation testing does cover um, the actual 
safety statistics that we're trying to measure. All right, so I'm going to cover a few terms. Uh, the first is, what is it exactly that we're trying to measure? Uh, ISO 26262, is, uh, which is about functional safety, is looking at uh, the risk of systems. And so in this case, if you have an autonomous vehicle, what is the risk that that autonomous vehicle poses to society? Where risk is both uh, harm, so how much like physical damage does it do, injury and collisions and stuff, but it also takes into account the likelihood of different types of harm. So it's kind of a, a measure of both like fatalities are really bad and injuries are bad, but not as bad, but also kind of a trade-off where if fatalities happen very, very, very infrequently, we can correctly weight that um, in order to get an overall kind of value for our risk. Um, and so risk is this combination thereof, where harm is uh, physical injury or damage to the health of people as defined by ISO 26262. And we define uh, severity as uh, there's four different categories, it's fairly coarse, so like no injury, light to moderate injury, survival is still probable, and survival uncertain. All right, um, so next we have three different forms of simulation objects. So first is the scene. So a scene is a snapshot in time. It is the physical state of the vehicles on a roadway at time equals t. Um, that's fairly intuitive. Uh, what's slightly less intuitive is what I call a situation. And uh, a situation is a scene, but in addition to the physical state, you have behavior states for each vehicle. Um, and so these things include intention, so whether I want to make a lane change, whether I want to go faster or slower. Um, attention, am I paying attention? Do I know what's around me? Uh, and, um, and then you can even have things like aggressiveness, uh, timidness, um, etc. And so things of that nature. So these are the uh, the human behavior states, and these are typically latent. So if you record a bunch of driving data, you don't necessarily know whether drivers are timid or aggressive. You have to infer it. Um, but when you're running a simulation, you know this stuff, and uh, and these behavior states do impact how vehicles behave over time. And then when you actually conduct a simulation. You propagate these scenes or situations forward in time, typically situation forward in time. And then a scenario is the result of that. So it's the rollout of running a simulation. So that's what you get. So in the end, the core principle of validation through simulation is to sample situations from a distribution that's representative of situations in the real world. You then run a simulation, and this gives you a scenario. So this gives you this rollout. And you'll do this many times. So you'll, if you want to do 2.1 billion kilometers, you might run 2.1 billion simulations, each for around a kilometer. And, um, and if these are all representative of general driving and you have your autonomous car in those simulations, you have all of these scenarios. And from those scenarios, you can extract your performance metrics. And uh, of course, these can be things like the risk I've already de described. So you can compute the risk associated with deploying your system and compare that to the risk uh, either a target level that you've set or uh, compare it to the risk without your safety system and hopefully the risk goes down. Um, but then there might be other things that we care about too. So things like, um, did we increase traffic congestion? Did we uh, increase CO2 emissions? Um, are we getting to where we want to get to on time? Are drivers, comf are drivers comfortable? Are passengers comfortable, etc. So yeah, all right. So. Uh, how do these simulations actually work? What are the models we need for this? So I already said simulation requires models. What, what models am I talking about? So at the core of simulation is the simulation loop. Um, and uh, this loop is applied multiple times. So every, every frame update, you have to do this one iteration of the loop. And, uh, and it occurs in three steps. So the first step is to observe. So all of your entities will observe their surroundings using their uh, sensors. And so you need sensor models for this. So this, these are things like LiDAR and radar for autonomous vehicles. And uh, if you have human drivers, you will model this also with sensor models. So things like perception, um, uh, modeling occlusions, et cetera. So we need, we need models for that. Um, next up, we have action selection. So this is where an agent has its belief about the world around it, and then it decides what to do. And this will be influenced by its behavior state, also its belief. And so an agent might decide to make a lane change, might decide to accelerate, turn, etc. And so these are human behavior models. And this is really tricky because human behavior models include all of this messy stuff, like intention 
uh, reasoning about other cars, um, and all of these complicated interactions in traffic. Um, but we need those models. And uh, lastly, we actually act. So we take that action and we use it to propagate that entity forward and get the next frame. And these are dynamics models. These are more understood, so things like physics equations, vehicle dynamics. Uh, but nevertheless, these models are needed. And uh, in some cases, we don't have everything that we require. Um, and so, sensor models, behavior models, and dynamics models. Unfortunately, that's not where the modeling ends. Uh, we also need to sample our, uh, our initial situations. And uh, for this, we need this distribution over situations, which requires a set of models as well. And so first, we, have, uh, we need some sort of distribution over the roadway that we're actually getting. Uh, so if we have an environment distribution, this might give us a roadway, um, which in turn, the roadway will inform a scene distribution, which will give us the physical state of the vehicles on that roadway, which in turn may inform a set of behavior distributions, which then populates this scene with behaviors. And of course, we need our sensors. So we may have some sort of sensor distribution that then allows us to populate uh, the sensors on each vehicle. Um, and all of these together form a situation. And so we actually need a lot of models. Uh, environment, scene, behavior, and sensor distributions. Uh, these are all stochastic models. And uh, behavior, sensor, and dynamics models, which are also typically stochastic models. Um, and uh, altogether, these are what form the validation and simulation framework. And we need to learn these models or obtain these models and build confidence that our models adequately capture what we need them to so that the performance metrics we extract actually mean something and can actually be used to establish confidence in something like an autonomous car. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to cover parts of this. So my dissertation covers my contributions to human driver behavior and sensor models, in addition to the scene distributions and accelerated validation approaches that I will cover in this talk. And so we're going to start with an in-depth look at how to model scene distributions which will kind of overlap with uh, behavior distributions a bit. And, uh, and then finally, we'll wrap it up with the fact that once we're done with this, once we have all of these models, we, can, uh, we still have to cover billions of miles in simulation, which can be prohibitively expensive. So we'll try to use some accelerated validation techniques so that we can get that done in a reasonable amount of time. The claims I will make in this presentation are as follows. So first off, safety validation does not remove the need for data. So clearly, we, need, we still need a lot of real world driving, maybe with our safety system, maybe without our safety system, because we need to collect information about how humans work, how they drive, and how they fail. Um, and in addition, we also need to collect information about how these new sensors that we're adding to vehicles work and how and when they fail. And that does require a lot of data. And so in addition to that, it's very difficult to cover data for rare events, which is what we're concerned about. Um, when these things fail is hard to model. And so that's, that's still core. So I'm not claiming that if we do everything in simulation, we get rid of the need for data. What we're actually doing is we're using the data that we do have to build these models more intelligently by leveraging then the models from the data to help us establish confidence. So critical events are very much in tune of what we care about. So critical events are those high risk scenarios or situations where um, high severity events can occur. And uh, we want to model those because those are the events where we uh, especially care about the performance of our vehicle and that are hard to test in the real world. And the space of driving situations is so large and complicated that uh, and then these critical events all kind of occur on the boundaries that it's really hard to get all of these tails. You need a lot of data to do it. So if you have all of possible situations, your data is only going to cover like a small subset of it. And the amount that it covers the critical events is going to be even smaller. Uh, so getting these tails is really, really hard. So one of the ideas I want to leave you with at the end of this talk is uh, that we'll need to apply a decomposed approach. So if you have, you can't just do one distribution over all these scenarios. That's why we're looking at things like sensor models and behavior models separately. So you can train models for those and you can hopefully get enough data to capture the tails in those distributions. Uh, 
and then use information from each decomposed distribution to help inform the overall uh, possibility of critical events. All right, so next we'll look at scene distributions. These are distributions over the physical state of entities in a roadway at time t. And so without any further ado, here we have our scene distribution uh, motivation. So we have a roadway with four cars. If we wanted to learn a distribution for this, what we might do is um, say, say, okay, each car has four parameters. So maybe here we have uh, two position variables, a speed, and a heading. And we could just clump them together and say, okay, that's a probability distribution. Let's take some data, learn that probability distribution, and say we're done. Okay, but um, then we quickly run into problems. So the first problem is uh, if we take away a car, suddenly um, we have to maybe marginalize it out. Does that even work? Maybe this is a new distribution and I have to learn this one. I can add a fifth car. Now we have 20 variables. So clearly the 16 variable one didn't work. How do I, uh, how do, I do this? Maybe it's a new, new distribution I need to learn. Uh, we can change the roadway. Uh, okay, so we want our distribution to be contingent on the roadway. So how does, uh, how does that work? Maybe we just learned a bunch of distributions. Clearly that makes it difficult. Suddenly we have to learn 10,000 different distributions and we need data for all of them. That's a little hard. So um, yeah, and four and five vehicle scenes is a little small. We actually care about much larger scenes than that. So how do we, how do we handle all of these? Uh, this is getting really complicated. And so we find that distributions over driving scenes have a lot of challenges that um, are not in, not, not, it's not really too easy to see how to get it past them. And so we want a distribution over driving scenes. Um, we want to capture correlations between a varying number of vehicles. So not just like three cars or four cars, but n cars. We want it to support arbitrary roadways. We want on-ramps, off-ramps, roundabouts, etc. We want to be able to efficiently sample. Um, I will care about an efficient relative likelihood calculation. We'll see why. And um, Automated learning is important. We want to be able to learn this from data without having to do uh, too much manual labor. So how has this been done in the past? So the first approach is uh, to use a database of scenes you've seen before. So if you're somebody like Google or Tesla and you've driven millions of miles in Palo Alto and Arizona, if you want to test more driving in Palo Alto and Arizona, you can just take scenes that you've seen in the past. And this is great if you want to test places you've already been at and if you've sufficiently covered them with test drive data. But uh, just sampling from what you've seen before will never extend to new unseen scenes, and um, it's not clear how to how to apply this to places you've never been. Um, and so that's that leaves something to be desired. Um, a second approach, which is often used, is to start with an empty roadway, and then uh, spawn vehicles, and use simulation to propagate them forward, and then kind of continuously fill up the scene with newly spawned cars. Um, it's hard. Uh, so this this does have several several issues. Um, so you you need a model for what types of vehicles to spawn, what intentions and spawning locations to have them at. So, and spawning locations are very kind of like roadway specific. Um, vehicle types are roadway specific, so you have to learn that kind of for each roadway, which it makes it hard. Um, you also need the complete simulation loop to work, so that all has to be spot on in order for this to, to be correct. On top of that, if you want to calculate the likelihood of the scene you ended up with, it is the probability of each car being spawned at the time that it spawned times the probability of each car taking each action that it took leading up to that scene chained up over the whole time that it took to get there. And that's only for the probability of it ending up at that scene based on the actions it took, but you could also end up at that same scene using a different sequence of actions typically, and so you need to kind of figure all of those out and kind of add all those probabilities together to get the probability that you actually end up with that scene. And that's really hard. Um, and so while this may give you things, it's kind of difficult to justify. Um, and so the first uh, contribution I made was a paper on generating scenes via local correlations. And here the idea is you start with an empty roadway and you learn one distribution over vehicles given the vehicles around them. And you will then spawn some vehicles using a marginal distribution from this. And then you'll condition on those vehicles to then sample the next vehicle. And then you'll condition on those to get the next vehicle. And uh, this lets you kind of build the scene outwards. And uh, this solves a lot of those problems. Um, however, it does have some difficulties. Difficulties being that it's hard to, you have to do a lot of marginalization, a lot of conditioning, um, a lot of inference. You have to uh, figure out how to extend this to arbitrary roadways and arbitrary correlations like across lanes and stuff. 
Um, it requires it requires knowing where and what vehicles to kind of like start it off with, um, and it's difficult to kind of incorporate the macroscopic structure of a scene ahead of time. And so if you have some roadways, like um, a particular on-ramp might be very heavily populated at a certain time of day, but then the main road might not be. Or you might have all of like the trucks on the right side and very few trucks on the left side. And that might be the case for one roadway, but not for like a different intersection. And it's hard to very quickly inform a distribution like this of macrostructure properties like that. Um, and so we'd like to figure out how, how to get around it. So what I will spend more time on is distributions using factor graph models. Um, we'll get exactly into what that is, but this does cover more, uh, this does solve more problems. And so roadways, I claim, are populated as they are in the real world. We get more of this macroscopic effect based on how we see it. Um, distributions over vehicle relations and types can be captured, works with arbitrary roadways. Uh, we get a nice benefit. So the learning objective is concave, which means A, it's potentially easier to train, but B, everybody will agree on what the optimal set of parameters is. And uh, you get efficiency via parameter sharing. So you're learning a, like a limited set of parameters rather than uh, like an infinite set of parameters. So here we have our roadway uh, with our four cars. So it's a scene. And I will now construct a factor graph. How am I doing this? Well, uh, what I'm going to start with is I'm going to add some factors uh, for each car. So that looks like this. And uh, each of these blue dots is a little probability distribution is what it can be thought of as. And this probability distribution captures things that are important for this car by itself. Things like a court, kind of probabilistically tying together its speed and lane offset and heading and yeah. Um, and you can incorporate other things like vehicle types, like trucks will maybe on average be going slower and sports cars will on average be going faster, things like that. Uh, but so far all of these cars are kind of by themselves. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tie together vehicles. Uh, what I've added here is an additional factor with lead follow relationship pairs. And this now is another probability distribution that kind of couples together the kind of speeds and positions of these two cars uh, because it's very unlikely that cars are just about to collide and it's um, you know, maybe more likely that they're kind of following each other at a nice reasonable distance for humans. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so we can construct that. And then uh, if we want correlations across lanes, we can add factors for that. And these might be, uh, these will prevent things from cars like getting too close to each other um, and capture things like that we're not gonna simultaneously make lane changes into each other. At least that's very unlikely. And so we have here uh, this factor graph I've constructed. I have to find a procedural way to do it. Um, and what I'm actually doing is I'm using copies of these three different factors. So I'm using a copy, four copies of the lane relation, four cop or one copy of the following, and four copies of the neighboring factor. And uh, each of those factors is a like, parameterized probability distribution, but the variables that we input into it um, are different based on which vehicles I've assigned. And so you can think of this as a bar product graph. That is, in fact, what a factor graph is. Uh, between the variables, which in this case are the 16 variables, four for each vehicle, and uh, instances of these factors. Um, so it's another way to look at it. Um, this will continue to work if we remove a car. We can still follow the procedural procedure to get our structure. Um, it will still work if we add another vehicle. So in this case, we have now two following factors, etc. And uh, we still end up with this distribution over this scene structure. Um, it will work for much larger scenes. So what I can do now is construct my factor graph here, and then I can still sample from it to get a new scene, uh, different speeds, different positions, but it still adheres to the original structure. So what exactly is a factor? Well, uh, mathematically speaking, a factor maps a subset of random variables, x1 through n, to a non-negative real value. Um, and so what that means is that you're going to take some of your variables, you have some function, and you get something that's greater than or equal to zero. Um, so you can think of this as an unnormalized probability distribution. So probability distributions integrate to one. So here just we, um, we may or may not integrate to one, but we do know that we are non-negative, uh, which is, yeah. Then we have uh, a factor graph, which is a combination of factors. So we have all of our variables, one through n, and a set of factors. And we're going to take the product over all of these factors. Since each factor is greater than or equal to 0, the result here is also greater than or equal to 0. So this product produces an unnormalized probability distribution. And to get a probability distribution, we need to divide by a constant scalar uh, z, which uh, causes it to integrate to 1. Now, uh, here's an interesting point. In order to find z, we need to integrate over all of these variables 1 through n. 
if we have 100 cars in our scene, that's 400 variables. We'd have to integrate over all of them in order to get this value of z. So z is very difficult to compute, but um, if you don't have z, you have this unnormalized probability distribution, which is just the product of your factors, which is relatively easy to compute. Uh, cool. Um, and we'd like to now sample from uh, the probability distribution defined by a factor f. So if we have a scene structure, we'd like to sample a new version of that scene under that structure. Turns out we can do this with the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, and it avoids the need to calculate the normalization constant z, which is something we're happy about. Uh, so here we have our scene, which we've constructed our factor graph for. And uh, what we're going to do is we have this transition distribution t. It's going to propose changes. Uh, so we'll sample from that. Maybe in this case, we're going to uh, propose this change here, where we now this pickup truck is kind of up more to the left. Uh, maybe it's going a little faster. Um, and uh, we're going to either accept or reject this change uh, according to this metropolis criterion down here. And so what that does is it's going to compare the relative likelihood. So this is the unnormalized likelihood of the new configuration over the unnormalized likelihood of the previous configuration. And if you could imagine for an instant that these are both probabilities, you'd have the 1 over z in front of each of these, and those 1 over z's cancel. And that's why we don't need to calculate it. Um, in addition, we also compute usually this relative likelihood between the proposal transitions. Usually that's 1, because we often choose a symmetric proposal distribution, but that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. So yeah, so basically it's this relative likelihood. And uh, we'll then accept it uh, according, to this, according to this likelihood. And um, maybe in this case, that pickup truck's in a good position. Maybe it's fairly likely. Maybe we accept it. So now our scene has this configuration. And we're going to sample a new proposal change. Uh, maybe this one uh, puts the car off the road. Maybe this isn't very likely. Maybe we don't accept it. Cool. But we keep doing this. We keep sampling proposal changes. We keep running it. We keep exploring this space in a probabilistic sense. And uh, at the end, when we stop, after, after a sufficient amount of time, we, uh, we have effectively sampled from the distribution over scenes defined by this structure. So yeah, so that's Metropolis Hastings. Um, the actual form of our factor graph uh, takes the form of a log linear model. Uh, so each of our um, factors is a set of features, and each feature maps a subset of the variables to any number. And, um, and then we weight them with weight theta, and we sum all those up, and we take an exponential, and that's our result. Um, and uh, so, of course, this is non-negative. Um, and uh, the features can be yeah, totally non-linear. It doesn't matter. You can use a random forest. You can use a neural network. Um, but you're not learning the feature. What you're learning instead are these weights that are applied to the features. And uh, each of those dots that I showed before, each of the colors, will learn one set of weights for each of them. Um, and that's where we get parameter sharing. And so uh, what do the features look like in my factors? Uh, so this is totally up to the designer, but uh, these are what I use. So I use polynomials over lane uh, offset speed and lane relative heading for my lane relation factor. Um, for car following, I looked at relative speed and headway distance. Uh, you could use inverse time to collision if you wanted to. Um, you could even incorporate information about the vehicle classes, so like truck and bus. And then uh, for the neighbor factors, I looked at uh, time to and distance at closest approach. Uh, this is to prevent two cars from making lane changes into each other. Um, but of course, you can incorporate additional information. You can incorporate things about um, M line and on ramp, what's the speed limit, stuff like that. Um, totally useful. Um, and then we want to maximize the likelihood of the data that we have when we're training. So we're going to adjust those weights theta to maximize likelihood. At least that's what one would principally do. And what that likelihood is, is the probability of x1 through n which is the product of the probability of each variable given the variables before it. That is the definition of likelihood. Unfortunately, that expands to this if you have four variables. And the probability of x1 requires integrating out everything after, so x2 through 4. Probability of x2 given x1 requires integrating out x3 through 4. So if you imagine if you have 100 variables, for this first probability, you need to integrate out 99 variables. That's a lot of work. And uh, we don't want to do that work. So instead, what is typically done is to maximize the pseudo likelihood instead. And the pseudo likelihood is a similar objective. It's the probability uh, of each variable given the other variables. And it turns out that here, you don't need to do this marginalization. You don't have to integrate out everything because you have all of that information in your conditional. Um, 
this is an assumption that's made. It slightly increases the uh, bias towards correlation, but this is um, the de facto industry standard, I would say, method for uh, learning parameters for vector graphs, or also called Markov networks. Um, and for that, please uh, refer to Kohler and Friedman's book, Probabilistic Graphical Models, uh, which provides an excellent overview. All right, so how do we know that these models are actually any good? Uh, so what I did is I looked at scenes that I sampled from my factor graph and scenes that I sampled from my uh, incremental roadway population model that I discussed briefly earlier. And we're going to compare that to distributions that I get from the true, uh, true scenes that I have withheld from uh, the training process. And so we look at things like speed, time gap, lane heading, lane offset, headway distances, stuff like that. And um, the uh, distributions that we get with the factor graph match much closer to the real world than distributions we get from the incremental roadway population model. Uh, and we can quantify that by looking at the kullback leibler divergence between these distributions. And so small error bars actually um, indicate that we're getting a closer match. And so beyond inspection, we can quantify that and that may. Another claim I made was that we do better at getting this macroscopic scene structure. And so here um, we have a much larger roadway. This is the whole Highway 101 roadway. Um, and we have these five lanes of mainline flow where traffic is congested. And then we have this auxiliary lane where uh, cars go faster, but there are fewer of them. Um, and I want to show that the factor graph approach still can mimic this, but um, just incremental roadway population doesn't really like know that this is happening. Um, so here we get like a cut-in view. So we have these five lanes, and then we have this one auxiliary lane where cars are going faster. And so here we see, um, again, a close match for each for the um, factor graph approach close match to the real world distribution where this is mainline flow and this is auxiliary flow. So here mainline flow is a little slower, auxiliary lane is faster, but the uh, factor graph approach is m much more able to capture that um, than incremental roadway population, which essentially predicts the same thing for each case. And, um, and also actually has a compounding effect where uh, by sampling successive vehicles, it actually ends up biasing over time to slower speeds, which is uh, concerning as well. So uh, in summary, uh, we have this new factor graph approach for modeling scene distributions. Uh, we end up with roadways that are populated as they are in the real world. We capture distributions over vehicle relations and vehicle types, works with arbitrary roadway configurations. And uh, as we will see, it incorporates uh, not just physical states, but we can actually extend this to intention and behavior parameters. And uh, there are some disadvantages. Every method has its disadvantages. Uh, first, we uh, require the, uh, the ability to specify factor graph construction rules. So I define an unambiguous way given a scene to construct a factor graph over it. And then when you run Metropolis Hastings on that, you will adhere to that same factor graph. Um, so that's a, that's a disadvantage. You can come up with your own uh, unambiguous factor graph construction rules. Um, it does require running for a burn-in time. So you need to, to figure out how to get sufficient mixing uh, to know that you run it for enough. If you run it for too little, you'll bias it too much to the initial configuration. If you run it for too long, you're wasting compute. Um, Again, check uh, Kohler and Friedman's work. And uh, lastly, we didn't discuss this, but we need uh, kind of starting scenes. And so what I used in my experiments was uh, were like actual starting scenes from the observed data, and then I shuffled those. But um, uh, if you want to try something new that you haven't seen before, you could also seed scenes artificially. Um, and then you could still construct the factor graph over that and explore that space. And even if you seeded it artificially in a somewhat poor manner, an unrealistic manner, let's say, you can still uh, run Metropolis Hastings on the factor graph and you'll still get something that is uh, probabilistically uh, at least valid insofar as it can be consistent with the initial scene structure. Um, last thing I'd like to point out is uh, we don't get a relative likelihood between two different structures, so you need an additional model if you need that. Um, and so that's, that's something that we need to look into for future work. It can be very difficult or intractable to get there, but uh, we're going to try try to think about that in the future. But for now, factor graphs I think are extremely promising and uh, useful. So next we move on to accelerated validation. Uh, this is the problem that we still need to cover billions of miles in order to uh, assess the safety of some of these systems if we're covering the full space of what can happen because most of that full space is boring and we're really interested about this fringe that is the set of critical situations. So how can we accelerate the validation by kind of avoiding some of those benign safe scenes. There are several different methods for this. One is to use a representative set of critical situations. Um, these critical situations can be mined from data, which is something we'll kind of do. 
Um, they can be mined from crash databases. They can be mined from expert um, investigations or uh, experience. And uh, the idea is then you might have a critical situation, which is your like rear end scenario that occurred that one time and that dangerous cut in and uh, maybe that one time a piano fell out of the back of a pickup truck. You can have all of these critical situations. And uh, projects like Pegasus are looking at constructing such critical situation sets. Um, what's really nice then for uh, the automotive industry is that if you have your vehicle, you can then test each critical situation and check it off. You can say, okay, I'm going to run this test. Did I um, match my performance objective? Um, I can check it off, say, okay, work there, uh, work there, work there, etc. So you can, you can kind of run through the laundry list of, of whether your car works. And so now one, uh, one kind of drawback of this is that uh, risk, which is something we care about, um, kind of needs both severity and likelihood. And here, if your critical situations come without any form of likelihood, you can't really compute overall risk. So you can still minimize severity, which does, uh, which is nice, but uh, you don't necessarily know whether you're then um, overall minimizing risk. Um, and plus, yeah, I mean, plus there are problems where if it's just this finite set of situations, you don't know if you've you've covered everything, or um, oh yeah, or not. You can also look at exhaustively enumerating everything that could possibly happen. This is not feasible. <laughs> the space of situations is so incredibly vast that there's no way that you could cover everything. Um, you really want to, again, and even if you do find a way to enumerate what you think is everything, you will either will have made some assumptions that are not valid, or you will have discretized things too much so that you're not actually uh, covering it in fine enough detail. So if you consider just uh, scenes with just like you know ten cars, it's already two to the ten configurations. If you just consider that each car can be attentive or inattentive. Uh, but there are a whole lot of other things. So um, you can uh, change the classes of the cars, truck, bus, motorcycle, you can have pedestrians, you can have different speeds, you can have different times of day, uh, lighting conditions, you can have weather, you can have roadway conditions that differ, different types of roadways where you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole lot of stuff that can, needs to be tested and enumerating over every possible configuration is just not feasible. Uh, another approach which we think is really nice is this is actually uh, developed by Richie Lee from uh, my lab. Uh, for the purposes of validating the safety of aircraft safety systems is uh, adaptive stress testing. And the idea here is uh, we're going to try to find the maximum risk ways in which our system can fail. And to do that, we're actually going to um, bias the behavior of other entities in the situation to achieve this. And so it's an optimization process in which you're trying to maximize risk. And so you have the entities make thing, uh, make take actions that are as likely as possible such that they still result in high severity. And so this, in tandem, kind of ends up with, with maximum risk. And this is really great for finding um, these high risk situations, um, but, <laughs> but it's, not, uh, it's not kind of an all-encompassing overall uh, risk value. You're, you're finding like these particular cases in which your vehicle fails. Um, and so it's incredibly useful at finding some things, but uh, you can't necessarily base your entire safety validation procedure based off of this. Um, yeah, so great. Also, um, as a side note, this is a great way to find bugs in your simulator because uh, if your entities are trying to optimize this, they will take advantage of any flaws if they can. <laughs> so there's also that. Um, important sampling is kind of the holy grail approach that we'd like to get working. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm exactly using important sampling. Uh, but it is maybe motivated, my approach is motivated by important sampling. The idea here is that we, uh, we care about rare events. So things like these critical events are thankfully very rare, but that makes it hard to, to measure. And uh, if you have an actual distribution over, um, in this case, scenarios, um, and you just sample from this, and let's say this is a distribution over how scenarios actually occur in the real world, you'd have to run a whole lot of samples and take the mean over a whole lot of samples if your performance metric is, say, uh, fatality rate, you'd have to do a whole lot of simulations before you go to like one or two maybe that actually have a fatality because most of this driving is very boring. And the idea behind important sampling is that you can draw instead of from the true distribution P, you can draw from a bias distribution Q, which will bias your sampling towards more dangerous scenes. And um, by weighting this relative likelihood, you can still back out the correct value. So you're encountering these critical events more often. but um, but correctly weighting the results so that you back out the correct solution. And uh, the approach I'm actually going to take is kind of motivated by this. Um, it's different, though. 
and it is heavily motivated what my professor did with it in Caracraft. So the idea here is we're going to try to identify these clusters of critical situations uh, by looking at data, and then we're going to model these distributions over these critical situation clusters. And by sampling from those during our evaluation procedure, um, we can more efficiently focus on critical situations so that we avoid benign driving. So this here is a plot that has <clears throat> Actually take my face away. This plot has uh, x-axis of time, y-axis of risk, and what we've done is we've run a simulation. It starts off, I mean, we sample it from the distribution, the true distribution. Um, uh, it's benign. We run it for a long time, and eventually we get a collision. And so this collision is, by definition, high risk, and um, we have at least high severity. And then we have uh, this t-terminal is that time of the collision. Now, because this was a simulation and we've recorded what, we, what we've done, we can go back in time and at any point back in time, we can compute a bunch of rollouts in order to estimate the risk at that time and then construct a curve. And the result from that look, may look something like this. So here uh, we have our high risk event, but if you go back far enough in time, you end up with this benign, uh, benign uh, situation. So normal boring driving just because most of driving is normal and boring. And eventually something occurred here that caused us to transition from this benign, safer driving to more dangerous, critical driving, which is up here. And so this transition is what we care about. So if we have some sort of criticality threshold, we can say that everything above the threshold is this critical driving, which we want to model, and uh, the rest of it's normal, boring, safe. And we really care about this critical transition. In my experiments, these plots do look like this, in fact. So here we have 100 uh, randomly chosen plots that did lead up to collisions. And if you go back enough far enough in time, um, your estimated risk goes way, way down to zero because most of this time we're really boring and safe. And then something will eventually happen that causes us to transition and uh, we exceed this threshold. Now, um, in this case, I've chosen a threshold of 15%. What does that mean? Um, and how did I choose it? Well, uh, you can move this down. And if you were to move this down, you would capture more critical events, well, critical events. Uh, but you wouldn't be accelerating the validation of your safety system as much because you're covering more boring things, right? Uh, if you move this up, let's say you move this up to 95%, you'd really only capture this, this like teeny bit of criticality. And uh, that would be really efficient because you'd be really like really testing that critical event. Uh, the problem is, presumably, your safety system may be acting leading up to this event that might prevent it from getting to that critical stage in the first place. And so you want this to be low enough that you're testing what your system's actually doing to prevent getting into critical situations. Um, and so in my case, with a, uh, as we'll see, we'll test a braking system, uh, we're acting in this regime, and so we want this to be low enough that your, your system is mainly acting after, after that criticality transition. And um, as an important note, most of the time your system's way down here. So there's a whole lot I haven't shown here, which is basically zero. Um, and so most of your time, you're still boring. Um, and so this is still this is still rare. All right. And so um, we have these critical situations that we've either mined from simulations, uh, which is what I've actually done, and, um, and then we want to cluster them. And this is a very interesting challenge. Uh, you're clustering temporal heterogeneous sequences. Uh, there are different ways to do that. And on top of that, there's the additional challenge that you have n vehicles. and uh, it's difficult sometimes to tell what vehicles are involved in making a situation critical. So for instance, a vehicle that doesn't even end up in a collision could be involved because uh, you swerve to avoid them and then hit somebody else, or like a pedestrian that you swerve to avoid and stuff like that. And so uh, figuring out how to cluster these is, uh, can be challenging. Uh, in my case, since I have a little simpler setup, um, left some of that to future work, and I used k-means clustering on features that I extracted from uh, the two critical vehicles that did end up in collisions uh, in my longitudinal driving situation. And I used the silhouette metric um, in order to select an appropriate number of clusters because it's not always clear how many clusters you do have. Um, now that we have these clusters, how do we sample from them? We need a distribution over situations. Before, our factor graphs were used to do distributions over scenes, which are physical states. Uh, but it turns out uh, we can actually extend our factor graph approach to, uh, to this as well. How do we do that? Well, before we had just the physical state. Now we include, in addition to that, this behavior state in the same way. They're just additional variables. And, um, and we can construct factor graph models uh, using similar approaches. And uh, in addition to these factors, I'm now also adding this critical factor that I assigned to the vehicle in the scenes, the vehicles in the scene that are actually critical. 
And uh, the reason I do that is because if I train a factor graph over the whole critical set of critical scenarios, um, without this critical feature, then all of the vehicles will be biased towards criticality when I sample with Metropolis Hastings. And I want to avoid that. Um, I really want to be able to tell the model like, oh, this one's critical or this one's critical, and the other ones aren't critical. And so it keeps the other ones not critical and the other one actually critical. Um, in addition, um, I have a particular need, and that need is that when I sample a new situation, I want it to maintain the same level of risk, because I care about the situations having this level of risk, right? Um, and so how do I do that? Uh, well, I can actually modify... What I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the probability distribution. So I'm only going to... I'm going to set the likelihood to zero if it is not within epsilon, but that is um, effectively the same as only accepting it if the risk is within epsilon of the target risk. Um, and so we're only going to accept scenes that are within epsilon of that risk, and so when we shuffle things around, we want to maintain that level of criticality. We're going to test a system like this, so breaking system that will break at the last moment. Um, got this from a, um, a paper that uh, had extracted it from a Volvo, um, and uh, we're going to use that, that braking system. And so here we have our driving simulation set up. Um, we have uh, longitudinal driving on a roadway. Uh, it's a cylindrical roadway. We have our vehicles. Vehicles are driving according to the intelligent driver model, which regulates their acceleration based on kind of following distance and following speed. And uh, that alone would lead to extremely safe driving, uh, unrealistically safe driving, and so we're also going to make these vehicles errorable. And errorable allows us to uh, model the fact that human drivers sometimes don't pay attention. And uh, these vehicles can switch between being attentive and inattentive. And when they're attentive, they're IDM. And when they're inattentive, they act with IDM, but assuming that the vehicle in front of them continues to do what it last did when it was last observed. Um, <clears throat> I then generated 1.33 years of driving and uh, used that to get my critical clusters. Um, so let's look at some of the clusters I obtained. Um, we have, oops, we have our first cluster here, which is long-term inattention. So the real vehicle is inattentive for a long time, and then very slowly, eventually, collides with the vehicle in front. Um, long-term inattention is unlikely. Um, so, for instance, here we have the likelihood of over all those 1.33 years of driving, <clears throat> of you picking a random frame, and of that frame being in cluster one. Cluster two is a little different. Here, the rear vehicle becomes inattentive, but then because it has a higher desired speed and uh, the vehicle in front was momentarily sped up, this vehicle will then continue to speed up and uh, collide with the vehicle in front. And then lastly, we had this third cluster, which uh, tended to occur when we had these interesting sinusoidal oscillations in our driving. And here, the, the last um, vehicle becomes inattentive at the wrong time and kind of uh, when the front car is kind of slowing down and runs into the car in front. Um, we can then leverage this to do some accelerated validation. And so here we have a log log plot. I will now assign two scenes that I generate, which before were pure human driving. Uh, I will assign my safety system to one car, randomly assigned to each scene that I sample, and I will run a bunch of simulations. And what I'm trying to do is estimate both how often my emergency braking system activates and also how often um, I get collisions. And so here um, we see that the black line is direct sampling. So I'm using these safe, boring scenes. Uh, or the, the, the standard is like the, the distribution of the true scenes, which includes a lot of benign ones. And we need a lot of simulations. So here, like almost 10 to the sixth, well, five times 10 to the fifth, roughly, whatever, three times 10 to the fifth. And um, before we even see these AEB activations, and it takes a long, longer for that to converge. Whereas with critical cluster sampling, by sampling from these critical clusters, because we can kind of skip those benign scenes because the system is really only activating in critical situations. Uh, we can encounter these much sooner and converge much faster. Same with the collision rate, where we're encountering collisions much faster. Uh, note here, a B activation rate actually um, occurs later, uh, and that's because uh, only one vehicle in the scene is equipped each time with the AEB, and so you can end up with collisions outside of that. Um, so that's why there's that discrepancy. Um, and then on top of validation, we can leverage it for optimization. So I can take that Volvo AEB, I can parameterize it, and then I can use an optimization technique where um, we try to adjust those parameters to get a maximum uh, performance, where here we're trading off between AEB activation rate and uh, injury rate. Injury rate is kind of the same as collision rate, but we're accounting for the fact that delta V matters. So like slower, smaller delta V is safer than a high delta V. Uh, 
Um, and we can make different trade-offs in who we get a Pareto frontier. I obtained this using uh, Gaussian process optimization with expected improvement optimization, and so that uh, allows us to much more efficiently optimize this, and we're using this accelerated validation technique. Um, so yeah, so not only can we do validation, we can then leverage it for optimization, which is what my professor did for aircraft. Um, I think that's cool. Um, and so here we have this accelerated validation technique with critical situation clusters. What we're doing is we're trying to like model the tails of these distributions, and we're kind of focusing our efforts there. Um, I kind of showed how to do mining using simulations uh, because you can then recompute those risk curves, uh, clustering the critical situations, and uh, then actually doing accelerated validation via risk enforced sampling. Uh, this is not the end all be all. Um, so of course, um, we make this big assumption that our safety system only acts after the critical transition threshold. So if your system is, if it's a fully autonomous car, it might be doing things that prevents it from getting to those critical situations in the first place. And on top of that, uh, we mined it with human driving data, and if you um, actually had autonomous cars, they might encounter these critical situations in different ways. Um, it might even produce new critical situations, and so you need uh, additional techniques, so things like adaptive stress testing in order to find these other ways in which these vehicles are uh, causing issues. Um, and lastly, it's expensive to generate critical scenarios. Um, it's expensive to do all of that mining, <laughs> if you will, um, and so maybe we need, we need additional techniques there. And, uh, and one thing I think is very promising is looking at uh, if you have your models for your, your sensors and your behaviors and you can look at the tails there and you see where those things are likely to fail. So for instance, if Tesla knows that, okay, my radar can't do well with white backgrounds or something, I can maybe generate more scenes that have like these pure white backgrounds when my radar is blinded. And uh, I can kind of leverage up these different failure modes, which uh, Professor Winner and T. Darmstadt calls the Swiss cheese model, and kind of figure out where these different failures can simultaneously occur that actually lead me to have a problem. Um, cool. Um, and of course, we can leverage other techniques like adaptive stress testing, like critical scenario databases, um, and maybe important sampling in order to overall get a uh, high um, confidence. And uh, so yeah, so here we have uh, my, my contributions and my thesis. If you'd like to read it, it covers behavior models and sensor models and scene distributions and accelerated validation. This bleeds over a little bit. Um, happy to discuss these with you if you email me. Um, in this talk, I covered scene distributions and accelerated validation methods. Um, and I'd like to end it by, uh, by saying that safety validation for autonomous driving does require understanding uh, these new failure modes, both uh, because before we were kind of validating the safety of physical mechanical systems, which fail in certain ways. But now we have uh, these new failures, which are caused by sensors, algorithms, and uh, humans. Uh, and I mean, even things like animals and stuff. And we need to figure out how these, uh, how these sensors and animals and humans all interact with each other, and that's really tricky. We need to leverage data in new intelligent ways. Uh, we still need real world data. We're not getting rid of the need for uh, driving miles. Uh, Maybe we're using it more intelligently, so maybe we can get away with fewer, but we still need data. Um, we can leverage accelerated validation techniques to establish confidence. And, uh, and in the end, all of these models that we get do still need to be validated against real world metrics. And so I validated against my simulator because I'm a grad student and I've got finite time and resources. But uh, these companies will need to make sure that their human behavior models continue to predict the behavior of cars around them, uh, that their scene models continue to well reflect scenes in the real world, um, and that sensor models continue to reflect how um, your sensors behave, especially in the corner cases that you're trying to cover these uh, rare, rare events. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, and I welcome any questions you may have.